burn injuries. For the most part, this should be generally preventable in industrial or work sites for instance we have safety precautions in place as required by OSHA so if there, whenever there are uh, flammable substances being used in a facility they're required to put first aid in place um, OSHA again requires that there are a uh, minimum number of fire extinguishers. And they're supposed to be located in strategic locations throughout the facility. There are many types of burns. It's not just from heat. Heat is one. We call it thermal burns. But you can also be burned by chemicals. Acids and alkali can both burn. Electricity can burn. This will also include lightning. That's also electricity. Finally, there's radiation burns. Radiation can be therapeutic radiation, as in the radiation we use to treat cancer, or it can be industrial radiation, whether for a nuclear power plant or a nuclear weapons facility. Next question on the blueprint is prevention. What are the ways you can prevent burns? I mean, um, uh, a fire, sorry, uh, fire prevention. So the textbook later, I can't find it right now, but it will mention about where and how many fire and smoke alarm detectors should be located around each house, on each floor. Uh, I emphasize that because one of the graduates that came said that that was the question they got on the NTLEX was the under prior fire prevention or under burn injury prevention was was on the location and number of fire uh, fire detectors, smoke detectors. So let's base it on your house, in, in your homes. Where are they located? Yeah. At least one on each floor, right? We have at least one. Is there one in each room? Is there one on each hallway? Okay, let's let's follow what's on the uh, fire code. Okay, it will be mentioned. I it's not right here. Next topic is the severity of a burn injury. What would indicate severity? There are four factors that will affect the severity of the burn. First is the extent. Extent meaning how much of your body was burned. So for this purpose, we will use the calculation method of rule of nines. That's the simplest. The burn centers, specialty burn units, will use the Lund-Browder method, which is very complicated and very detailed, but we are beginners and the NTLEX will be happy with just the rule of nines. Next to extent is the depth. How deep is the wound? How many tissue layers were burned? Three is the location of the burn. What part of your body was burned? Any injury to the face is priority any burn injury to the face or the neck for that matter, because what will fire always do? Does it, does it ever burn down? Does fire ever burn down? It always goes up, right? So therefore, whenever you have chest, neck, or facial burns, that means you have inhaled either the smoke or the fumes burning your airway. Another location is the hands and the feet, because how will you do ADLs without your hands and your feet? Another is another lo bad location are the genitals in the perineum all the way, you know, around the perineum, because what will happen to that area after it get burned? Infection, high risk for infection. Then finally, the cartilages, which are your nose and your ears, because do they have good blood supply to begin with? No. No, there are. They have very poor blood supply. That's why in 
in Frostbite, which we'll do later in the semester, in Frostbite, uh, they come off, right? Meaning they're the first ones that will be injured. Same thing also if they're burned, they will be very difficult to heal because they have very poor blood supply. And then another factor to be considered are the patient's comorbidities. When we talk about that, it will always be the age. Very young, very old, uh, very young, very small skin surface, right? I mean, a baby only has, compared to an adult, it's very easy to burn a small child. And whereas in the elderly, I mean, describe the quality of, or the characteristic of an old person's skin and burn that skin. So is it easy to heal? No. Not likely to heal. Other comorbidities would be if the patient has any chronic illnesses, namely diabetes, heart failure, kidney failure, or COPD, the very organs that we need when these burn patients will have to compensate. Okay, so if they already have problems with those body systems, then that will affect the severity of their burn injury. That's all in this paragraph here. Oh, here's prevention. Uh, let's see if it's in the paragraph. No, it does not say where the location should be. <clears throat> How often should you check? the batteries on your smoke and CO2 detectors? <clears throat> at least once a year. At least once every year. If you check it twice, even better. Most people check it when the times change. Either you pick spring forward or fall back. Okay? Whichever um, time change period you, you want to do it. Because they're useless if the batteries are dead, right? Because not all of them, you notice how most of them have this really annoying loud alarm when the batteries are weak or, or low. Uh, and then you won't stop until you change it. Or at least if you brave it enough, you're that kind of deep sleeper. You just let it die out. Okay, but they should be replaced. Otherwise, they're useless. Who has ever had the house burn here? Like it really burned down? Yeah, my mom's house burned down two days before Christmas. Where is yeah, Trinidad? Uh, oh. Dominican? Where is home? Oh, Antigua. Oh, what about you, Hannah? Oh, I see. Mine just happened this Christmas, two days before Christmas. What a three family house. This is just terrible, right? And the, not to mention, I hope nobody got hurt, though. Nobody got burned. I mean, no. property can eventually be replaced, but no. burn injuries, uh, they leave scars, right? I mean, they'll heal eventually, but they'll leave lasting scars. Okay, we already talked about the severity of the burn. So I mentioned age, the depth of the burn. Let's pause here for a moment under depth. We have a table. However, I will also grab the options on the paragraphs. There are four paragraphs that will follow the table. But let's discuss using this table. So there are one, two, four columns, no, five, right? Five columns. The way I remember this in school is I look at the anatomy of the skin and that's how I remember the appearance. Or you could do old-fashioned if you want to memorize this, have at it. But since I know that first-degree burns only affects the epidermis, only the outer, and the epidermis, is that really living tissue? No, no. Not really, right? Okay, so that's why all you'll have here manifestations are hypersensitivity. It's painful, but it will easily 
-hmm. Right. It will easily heal because it's only the outer surface of the of the skin. And that's what we will look. It will look red. It still blanches with pressure because circulation is not affected. Very minimal or no edema at all. There may be a few blisters. Number one example is a sunburn. So complete recovery in a few days. It will hurt for a few days, but that's it. For second degree, it now involves the epidermis as well as the dermis. Keep in mind the dermis contains all the living structures of your skin. So this will help regenerate the skin, grow new epithelial cells. So these are now beyond sunburns. If you have sunburn here in the first degree, the example here are skulls. You know, when you care less in the kitchen, for instance, you pour hot water or hot coffee on yourself. So this one is more painful. There will definitely be blister. There's mottling, weeping, and edema. So it'll take longer to heal. Third degree. A reminder also, I'm warning you, the NCLEX may not use first, second, third, or fourth degree. They may use superficial, partial thickness, full thickness, all right? And then for fourth degree, they call it uh, still full thickness, but uh, other textbook called this deep full thickness. So for third degree, it now involves still the epidermis and dermis now includes the subcutaneous tissue and some connective tissue. Whereas in fourth degree, it goes into the muscle and the bone already. So if you notice, look at the change in the color. So you have here from red, still blanching in first degree. Second degree, you still have uh, red, but now it's, uh, it's more mottled, okay? And uh, we still have a red base because the skin is burned off, especially if the blisters now pop, then the wound bed is obviously red and plenty of edema. Here, what's now the color? It's now white, pale, red, brown, leathery, because this is now, what are you looking at? You're looking at SCAR. Hey, you're looking at burnt tissue. Do they have blood, blood flow? No more. That's why they look this color. Here, is there still blood supply, blood flow? Yes, yes. yes that's why it looks red. Okay. This one, will there be blisters in, in third degree? Mm -hmm. No. In order for you to have a blister, it needs a, an intact an intact epidermis, right? There is no, no more epidermis here. It's already burned off. So there will be no blisters at all. Whereas fourth degree, you can literally see through the muscle. Although it may not necessarily be visible because you may see just charring. Okay, you'll see black. You'll just see sut and you won't see the muscle or the bone until you remove the, the burnt tissue. Any questions? Or I can go pictures. I can use a picture on your test question. Like I said, I will. I can grab the description from the paragraph because I'm very limited here in the table. Especially if I use select all that apply, you know, I only have three, four choices. I need five or six, so I'll have to grab the fifth and sixth from the paragraph. But if I use the pictures, of course, I'll use the pictures that are on your textbook. Let's go now to the extent. As I mentioned earlier, we will use only the rule of nines. We will not use the Lund Browder. Lund Browder method is just way too detailed. It's a bit difficult to memorize. Here's the rule of nines. And here's the, well, there's no in picture. Okay, here's the, we only have a picture of the rule of nines, which is perfect. So everything is nine. The head are two nines, nine for the face, the interior aspect of your face, nine for the back of your head. <clears throat> the whole torso, anterior torso are two nines. Obviously that's big. So that's 18 and then eight, another two nines in the back. Each arm are two nines, nine in each side of the arm. 
anterior arm, posterior arm, each are nine. Legs, that's the penalty of uh, real estate, right? So we have 18, meaning two nines anterior. I uh, know this is 18, that's one nine for each side, right? Uh, no, sorry. Each arm is uh, nine, so that's four and a half for each side. Sorry. Okay, my mistake. Professor, yes. So, um, the anterior, the 18% posterior, 18% anterior. It's for which one? The torso or the leg? For the torso. Okay, torso is 18, two nines in front, two nines in the back. The leg are two nines each, nine in front, nine in the back. So if you count that, how many nines is that? It's 11, right? So if you got here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, eight, nine, 10, 11. That's 11 nines, right? So to complete the 100, we have the perineum. So that could be the genitals, the rectum, that's entire, that entire perineal area is 1%. Any question? Okay, so let's do an example. Let's burn May Jean. So May Jean <laughs> is uh, 120 years old. Okay, and she now weighs at 120, she's already weighing 60 pounds. Okay, so the her CNA is Adler. Adler picked up May Jean for her weekly bath. So put her in the tub. And Adler was busy, let's say it was the World Cup, okay? And um, uh, Argentina, and this time, where's Messi now? He's in Miami, right? Yeah, so they, uh, they were playing the final. So he was busy, yeah. and then he didn't notice that when he picked up what he thought was a bubble bath in a gallon, somebody put a hydrochloric acid in it. But they did label it hydrochloric acid, but they were next to the bubble bath. And he didn't pay attention. So that's inadvertently what he was pouring. And 120 years old, a 60 pound May Jean is already uh, has advanced dementia. Okay, so and she's you know very frail and she she's nonverbal. So she just she just quiet quiet quietly laid down there and then just suffered. Okay? <laughs> All she did was ah, ah. and the TV was loud. Right, so it, it took a while before Adler noticed. By that time, the the acid is already there's already two inches of acid, and May Jean is laying flat. So from her head down to her heel, she suffered stage three burns for uh, uh, third degree burns. Calculate her TBSA using the rule of nines. You're close though. And remember, she is um, 120 years old. So what does a 120, 120 year old genitals look like? Actually, it's not wrinkled, it's saggy, right? Yeah, it'll sag down. Right? And it, so the, the genitals, her, her labia are also swimming in the, in the hydrochloric acid. How much you got? How much? No, go ahead. What would you say? The scarecrow was very close. How much is the head? It's too much now. How much is the head? 50, uh, 50. Okay, it's 50.5. All right. Okay, let's finish uh, taking care of Mei Jean later. Okay, so... May Jean was burned. Uh, we'll get to the management when we get to the interventions. So we'll skip the Palmer or the Lundbrauder method. We'll just stick with the rule of nines. Now let's describe what actually happens when human tissue is burned. Remember the processes we saw in sepsis? when the patient enters the SIRS stage on its way to, on their way to severe sepsis stage. What happens again during that period? 
what happens to the capillaries? Because is this a serious injury or is this minor? Burning is a very violent injury, right? So therefore, will it trigger SIRS? Yes, this will trigger increased capillary permeate, uh, capillary membrane permeability, not only in the burn area, but will affect the rest of the body as well. But initially, it will only involve the burned areas. So there will be increased capillary leak or increased capillary membrane permeability in the burn areas. And then in the next 12 to, 12 to 36 hours, it will get worse. It will now start involving all the capillaries in the body okay, because of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And this is what happens. So this is systemic inflammatory response due to severe burn injury signals. And it will cause the release again of massive amounts of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, histamines throughout the body. For electrical burns, they describe electrical burns as a grand masquerader because the Burn injury in an electrical burn, whether it's caused by lightning or electricity from power lines or from your household uh, outlets, for instance, will only have a one area of your body. Sometimes you may have, depending on the duration of your exposure to the electricity, so if it's more than a couple minutes, uh, I mean more than a few seconds, it will have an entry and an exit wound. Meaning, let's say if you touch a live power line with your hand, as it travels through the body, more than just a few seconds, it will exit your body it is somehow. So it's either, like uh, my experience with this was I was a, a company nurse for a resort. One of our electricians, because we, we had these problems a lot because our the hotel, the resort had bungalows and underneath the bungalows were mangroves, meaning they're literally on the water. So our, um, our what do you call those air conditioning? Oh, the ones, uh, the compressors okay, were outside and they were very close to the water. So they, it's, it's high risk for you know, water and electricity, bad mixture, right? So one of our electricians got electrocuted and he had what looked like a stigmata. You know what a stigmata is? Like Jesus Christ, he had the two nail marks here. He looked like that. He looked like, what do you look like? You look like Jesus Christ. Okay, so he had an entry and an exit wound okay, from the electrocution. So we brought him to the hospital as is the protocol because what's really the why is it called the grand masquerader why do they say that the injury in an electrical burn is like an iceberg meaning all you see is just the tip of an iceberg because most of the injury for electrocution is inside it's in the internal organs especially the heart because can it disrupt the electrical activity of the heart yes, yes. So uh, my patient, though, our electrician didn't lose consciousness, so I know he didn't have any any cardiac, uh, serious cardiac uh, dysrhythmias, but that was at that, at that time. So we were only five, 10 minutes away, depending on the driver from the hospital. So we uh, took him there, and then I don't know what happened afterwards. So he was back to work the next week. So here's the description of entrance and exit wounds in an electrical injury. Uh, lightning will be the same. Your priority for managing electrical burns, of course, after um, saving the patient, meaning separating the patient from the electrical source. However, you manage that. <clears throat> you put first aid at the scene, but the priority is to take them to the nearest hospital.
Let's go to besides the vascular. So we did the description of the vascular changes, which is the systemic inflammatory response syndrome and the increased capillary membrane permeability. What will be the heart's reaction to a burn injury? Because how much fluid do we lose in a burn injury? Because the skin, what's the purpose of the skin? Give me four functions of the skin. Protection. Number one, protection. Next. Respiration. Respiration. Meaning elimination. In the chain between the gases. Respiration. Well, not really. Um, you mean um respiration. How though? Yes, we did protection. Mm -hmm. Next would be okay, thermoregulation. Okay, what that that keeps us warm, right? We have skin to keep us warm. What else? You just mentioned about fluids. Okay, we literally are like a we're like a bag, right? We're like a bag because how much fluid are we? We are depending on your age, right? We between 70 and 80 percent fluid, right? Water. So therefore, what's keeping that water inside? The skin. Okay, so that's three. Number four, which is not very, you know, not really critical, which is the vitamin D synthesis, right? Okay, that's four. And fifth, of course, you can add a fifth, you know, for your appearance, your identity, right? Yeah, but women especially, yeah, you like your skin is very important. So imagine you burn the skin, a lot of it. So what happens to all those four functions? Mm -hmm. All right. So what do you think because of the loss of fluid volume here? Because there are two ways water will be lost. One is absolute. Water just evaporates off of your, of your body because there is no skin. There's no skin here. So water will literally evaporate out of there. Next. Remember the, the, the increased capillary membrane permeability, right? So each capillary will leak water. So therefore, are you going to have edema? Yes. So you have you lost water two ways. You lost it absolutely through evaporation, but you also lost it relatively by third spacing. We, call, we don't call it edema though, because this is not caused by congestion. This is caused by leaking of the capillary. So therefore, it's caused by we call it third spacing okay because the large molecules come out and water will follow those large molecules so we call it third spacing so therefore what will be the reaction of the heart immediately after the burn tachycardia and well supposed to be vasoconstriction right yeah but here unfortunately there will be no vasoconstriction because of the massive amounts of inflammatory substances they will cause vasodilation so what type of shock will result in a burn injury and there's actually two this is no heart attack distributive shock okay so two forms of shock hypovolemic and distributive shock because there's massive vasodilation here So we mentioned hypovolemia. So what do you think will be the first aid when we get to management without looking at the textbook? textbook? Okay, fluids will be number one. So here, uh, this is called hypovolemic shock, just sheer volume loss through the skin, absolutely and relatively. Uh, and just this, as described here, unlike traumatic injuries wherein you have you lose blood, there is really no loss of blood here. The RBCs are within normal, uh, relatively within normal. You lose some because you burn some blood, of course. But most of the fluid loss is sheer fluid, it's sheer uh, water. So here are system by system. Uh, put it in a table for pulmonary. We haven't discussed ARDS yet, but this patient will develop ARDS. Because remember in sepsis, was there ARDS in sepsis? Yes, so same here in burns. Because of the, well, vasoconstriction again will only be in response to the 
catecholamines, but however, because of the massive amounts of cytokines and histamines, there will actually be vasodilation. GI, because of sympathetic stimulation, will there be any peristalsis here? Okay, very low, if any. And kidney, of course, because there's loss of uh, fluid volume, what type of AKI will result? Pre-renal pre AKI. So, but this chapter 57 will only discuss burn injury though. We already finished AKI, correct? In first mod module one last semester. So no more discussion of AKI here, but will this patient develop AKI as well? Yes. And shock as well. Yes, so we're only dealing with burns, okay, in this in this chapter. But you you should know that the patient is in shock and is in AKI. Okay, so the leaking, the capillary leaking will continue up to 36 hours after the burn injury. So knowing this, that the patient's edema will extend beyond the the burn injury, do we intubate these patients early or late? We should intubate early because we cannot wait for the edema to reach the airway because by then, can you still can you still pass the laryngoscope and the endotracheal tube? No, the airway will thicken so much because of the capillary leak that you cannot even put a straw in there. So we have to intubate. We anticipate that it will get worse up to 36 hours, so we better prepare this patient. Yeah, we tell them, sir, we're gonna have to intubate you in a couple hours, okay? Because your, your, your airway is gonna, gonna swell, you're gonna have edema all over your body, and we, we have to prepare for that, okay? So you tell them ahead. However, as the capillaries begin to regain, meaning the, remember, uh, we discussed under sepsis that the increased capillary leak syndrome is self-limiting, correct? We just don't know when exactly it will stop. Uh, but again, there's no drug that can that can shorten the period. It's just the patient's body okay, that will determine it. Uh, again, this is a self-destructive, if you want to if you want to describe it that way, it's a self-destructive reaction to a severe injury, to sepsis, to burns. Let's discuss two electrolyte um, problems that will occur. So let's review AKI. What were the first two phases of AKI again? Oliguric and the diuretic phase. Okay, so the patient is in AKI, correct? Okay, so the period will will correspond to the period of the burn injury as well. So the first four hours since there is edema and then there is the, the cells were destroyed, correct? So they were burned. So what did those dead cells spill out? Potassium. So therefore, and then the capillaries are leaking. So therefore, what do you expect for the potassium levels to be during the first few hours. Is it hyper or hypo? Initially, it will be hyper, okay, because the, the cells are dying, okay? However, Remember, what did you say to me will be the treatment for the first, what is the priority treatment? Okay, so now as you start flooding this patient's bloodstream with fluids, we'll calculate later how much we're giving. What will happen to the, the concentration of your blood now? There will be dilution, so therefore what will happen to the potassium? Then you'll have hypokalemia, right? Initially though, because of all the injury, there will be hyperkalemia. But as soon as we flood this patient with lots of fluids, it will become hypokalemia. I have to discuss that because the some graduates also came back and said they got that question on the NTLEC also. The they were asking, yes. Uh, there's no such thing though. Um, but uh, 
to not just the IV fluids we're giving, but remember there's a oligoric and a diuretic phase. Okay, uh, so diuretic phase usually um, puts the fluid back into the bloodstream now. So that will contribute further to the uh, hypokalemia. But uh, it's not mentioned specifically here that it's dilutional, uh, but you could be correct. Could be from the just sheer increased amount of fluid returning to the vascular compartment. Again, I can't quote that because it's not mentioned in the textbook. But theoretically, yeah, that would that would that would be it. Okay. Hey, let's talk about this alert. Now, when we get to management, there are phases in the burn injury. The first phase, well, technically there's a pre-hospital phase, which is not really mentioned consistently uh, across textbooks. The pre-hospital phase involves at the site of injury because where do burn injuries occur? Do they happen in the hospital? Outside. Always outside, right? In a home, in a workplace, in a nursing home. It's always outside the hospital. Therefore, did someone expectedly perform some first aid at the, at the scene? Yeah. No, you would just watch and take out your phone and look. And then upload it. Okay, well, normal people would still go help, right? Like put out the flames, right? So, so people would help. Okay, so that's what's expected. So that's the pre-hospital phase. There will be a short chart or table later on that. Uh, but let's finish this alert. The first major phase really is the emergent or resuscitative phase. Some textbooks say emergent, some say resuscitative. The reason is the major intervention in this phase is fluid replacement. And imagine you've seen chicharron, right? Who doesn't know what chicharron is? Who does not know? You don't know what chicharron is? Okay, so when you um, fry or bake um, skin, uh, pork skin, what does it look like now? Really tight and crispy, right? Okay, so let's say we burn somebody's skin. What will happen to that skin? So let's say the temperature is 300, 375 degrees. What will it do to the skin? Well, depend. it will not scarf right away. It will just, it will cook, right? It will tighten, right? So same thing here. So what will happen to the skin now? If it's now really burned, will it still be soft and flexible like this? Or will it be like chicharron? It will be chicharron. It will be crispy, right? And tight. So therefore, what happened? And there's edema, correct? So how can edema, if you have edema inside, but then the skin is like chicharron. So what will happen there? Is it? Is it gonna be possibly acute compartment syndrome? Yes, because this is no different from putting in a tight dressing or a tight cast, correct? So same effect. So the patient will develop compartment syndrome if it's a circumferential burn, of course. So let's say you burn the entire arm, the entire leg, or the entire circumference of the torso. Okay, so that's what we call compartment syndrome. So what did we do in compartment syndrome under MedSearch 1? What did the doctor do? So your duty was, what were the six Ps again of compartment syndrome? Uh, don't just say pain. You should say unrelieved pain. Okay, Unrelieved pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, pressure, or paralysis, right? Okay. No, sorry. That's fine. Yeah, that we have six. Okay, we have six. Does it have to be all six? No. No. One is enough, right? You suspect one one of the piece is enough for you to report to the doctor. Knowing, you know, the, the, the patient suffered a circumferential burn, it would be different if you just burned one surface. Say you burn this, it won't result in compartment syndrome because it can still swell 
here. But if you burn the entire circumference, it's like a tourniquet, right? It's like a, uh, a cast or a, a, a dressing. So this is what they'll do. So what did the doctor do in uh, compartment syndrome? So you reported, you recognized six, one or six piece, and you reported. And what did the doctor do when they came? What was that procedure? Fasciotomy. Okay. So fasciotomy was performed, right? What is the fascia again? Fascia is the... Is that like clear, clear membrane, right? Over the muscle. Correct. So, no, actually, it's above the muscle. So, it's between the fat and the muscle. So, that's the fascia. So, you cut through skin, cut through subcutaneous tissue, cut through the fascia, and then you expose the bone. So, that's fasciotomy. What is this called? Because since the, the cut didn't go deep into the the the, the muscle, the, into the fascia. So this is just the, this is what you call escarotomy. It's called escarotomy. So the doctor will make an incision through the escar. Okay, so escar is dead, burnt, dead tissue. That's escar. So the doctor will have to cut through that in order to relieve pressure, restore circulation to the extremity, okay? Because what's the reason of the six piece? Why did they appear? Why is there, okay, there's compromise. Is it only circulation that was compromised? What about nerve function? Nerve function, what about lymphatic circulation? Yes, so arterial, venous, cap, um, lymphatic, and nerve, uh, <clears throat> nerve, um, Function was all affected. It's not a bomb, is it? A bomb? What is that? <laughs> that was, that was the heater. Ah. <laughs> so we cut through here to restore circulation. Okay. So the compartment syndrome in burns, circumferential burns, is managed by escarotomy. Okay. So it's fasciotomy if it's uh, in a muscle. Okay. So here are again the changes. So first few hours will be hyperkalemia first and then eventually hypokalemia. For sodium, in both instances, they will remain low. There will be hyponatremia most throughout the burn injury. Uh, again, because of severe fluid loss. It's the sodium and water is just lost, so sodium levels will be very low. So here's another escarotomy. This one, though, reached the uh, fascia. Okay, so you see muscle exposure here. Uh, pulmonary, like I said, also in sepsis, we'll discuss ARDS later in the semester under Module 6. The airway involvement here will have two part, parts. It will be upper airway and the lower airway. Upper airway, obviously because of the inhalation injury when the patient inhales fumes, like really hot fumes, or it could be also lower airway in the form of smoke. Okay, So the CO uh, poisoning occurs here. So the patient, let's say, uh, in a close... Uh, space, let's say uh, our warehouse was burned or an apartment building, that, there's going to be a lot of smoke there, right? So patient may die. Will they die from the burn or from the smoke inhalation? Okay, that will kill them first. So here are your indications. So how do you know the patient suffered an inhalation injury? And therefore, we call rapid response for immediate intubation. So the signs would be singed facial hair or carbos, carbos, carbonous, carbonaceous sputum, uh, black, uh, black sputum, or anytime you have any chest, neck, or facial burns, automatically you assume inhalation injury. And of course, lung sounds, what will be the uh, breath sounds you will hear? Uh, 
No, this is uh, airway injury. So stridor and wheezing, right? For lower airway, the doctor will do a bronchoscopy to clean out the debris. You know, they'll remove the uh, the soot, the whatever was in there. So we remove the SCAR, if any, so that the airway is clear and patient's oxygenation will improve. All right, so that's upper and lower airway. Let's stop here for the CO poisoning. The difference between CO oxygen and CO2, what's the difference between those three gases? Carbon monoxide, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. What's separating those three? So carbon monoxide is CO, one molecule each of carbon and oxygen. Oxygen is two molecules of oxygen. CO2 is one carbon, two oxygen. So they're only really separated by one single molecule. So can the hemoglobin tell them apart? No idea. So all the hemoglobin can see is there's two molecules there, right? So therefore, which one was, is easier to carry, CO or O2? CO. So in theory, hemoglobin molecules actually have a higher affinity for CO, meaning if you, put, if you give the blood both, you put the CO there, you put carbon monoxide there and oxygen, what do you think they'll take? They'll take CO. So once the four binding sites of the hemoglobin molecule already has CO, can oxygen attach to the hemoglobin? No more. So because of this, because this is not CO2, right? This is CO. So as far as the color is concerned here, what will it look like? What will the patient look like? Will they look blue? No, because there is oxygen there. There's still oxygen, it's just missing one molecule. So therefore, what's the manifestation in carbon monoxide poisoning? Yes, there's dyspnea. However, there will be no cyanosis. In fact, what will the mucous membranes look like? Cherry red in color, right? So any burn injury patient you, you see unconscious, you look at the mucous membrane. If the, what is cherry red? really bright red, right? Yeah, that's cherry. So if the color is like that, then you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning. The treatment is just oxygen. You just give them oxygen and eventually the CO will be discarded from their system and then you'll have a resumption of oxygen carrying capacity. Why is there bronchoconstriction? Why did we intubate the patient early again? Okay, the, the, the edema, right? The third spacing, the ca increased capillary membrane permeability. Or in this case, if it's inhalation injury, of course, the burning process. So you burn the mucous membrane. So of course, the reaction of the smooth muscle will be to swell. Plus the effects, of course, of your um, your um, again the histamines, okay, the cytokines that were released, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Kidneys, what will happen to urine output? Okay, why? Okay, from the sympathetic and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, immunologic, will there be a rise in WBCs here? White blood cell count? It won't rise? Yes. Uh, which type? Which ones will rise? The neutrophils, leukocytes, neutrophils, uh, lymphocytes, eosinophils. Eusino but the total never, nevertheless will be elevated. 
Uh, what will happen to the patient's thermoregulatory capability? No skin, and they're unable to regulate temperature. So that's why here burn centers often have additional heating sources to help maintain body temperature. Uh, as GI tract already mentioned earlier, there will be very slow motility here. So what will be some of your treatments? Because will the acid production increase or decrease? Increase. This is an injury, massive injury. So increase stomach acids, however, decrease motility. So what will form? Ulcers. All right, management now. So there are three phases. We will only discuss the first two, emergent or resuscitative and the acute or intermediate. Re rehabilitation will take years, if not a lifetime. So before the emergency, uh, emergent or resuscitative phase, I mentioned earlier, there's a pre-hospital period, right? So on the scene, someone is bound to have provided first aid somehow to the patient. So we have a chart that will describe our interventions. Here it is, chart 57-4. Please use common sense when using these, depending on the scenario on the test question, okay? So let's say if the patient, what's... Uh, important, A, B, C, or um, the skin infection, A, B, C first, right? Okay, so therefore, will you give oxygen first? Okay, but before you give oxygen, what should be done first? The patient's on fire. They're on fire. The clothes are on fire, so... Are you going to do, do you have the oxygen here? You have the mass or the cannula? Okay, so put the fire out first because what will happen if you apply oxygen while they're still on fire? Okay. So how do we put out the fire? Okay, so whatever you can find. You have a fire extinguisher, that's all you got. Or if the patient's still conscious and can follow commands, stop, drop, and roll. But usually if they're on fire, what will they do now? Just run, right? <clears throat> so somebody knock them down and then ho either hose them down or cover them with a damp blanket. Cool the burn. Does it say ice the burn? No. So do we use ice? No, no. Do not use ice. Because is there already vascular damage here? Is there circulation? Um, compromise? Yes. So if you put ice, what will happen? Further vasoconstriction. So only cool the burn. So this is both for extinguishing the heat and also to boost, yeah, relieve pain. Okay. Remove any restrictive objects. So while before the burn uh, causes edema, remove anything constrictive, okay, like rings, for instance, or watches, those bracelets that you have, you know, those um, cancer walk rubber bracelets because they will start to uh, constrict the, the limbs once the, or necklaces also, okay, like chokers especially. So they'll become um, tourniquets. Uh, cover the wound. Hopefully if you have something clean or sterile would be nice, but uh, whatever you have. Stop, cover, cover it with a clean um, object. Again, do not use um, ice. Okay? If it's chemicals, now only do this if you're trained or you are absolutely certain about what chemical the patient was exposed to. Okay, If you do not, please do not attempt any irrigation. Because you, if you have no idea what that chemical is, are we clear? Meaning, unless you're trained, let's say you, you work in a factory and you're, you are you know that when someone is exposed to that, you already know what to do. Okay, so <clears throat> do it if, if you're trained. However, if not, your only job there is to really be remove as much of the chemical 
as you can safely. So let's say it's the dry chemical. Can you brush off the dry chemical? Yes, if it's powdery, brush it off. If it's, what if it's wet? So what can you remove then if it's wet? Okay, any clothes that are wet with that chemical, remove them. Granted, they, they, they're not stuck to the skin because otherwise if they're stuck and then you remove, then you peel off the skin, right? Um, again, only rinse, whether water or not, if you're knowledgeable about that chemical because you may get things worse because we don't know what the reaction will be for one chemical with water may create something else. We already talked about airway compromise, so that's your priority. We keep the patient NPO because we don't really know whether there's peristalsis or not. Uh, plus this may cause vomiting and then the patient will end up aspirating. So NPO. All right, let's go to a break. And then we'll start with the fluids when we come back at 2.55. Thank you.